and welcome back from the break to a new broadcast or the continuation of the broadcast we just did. Tom Fress from Inquisition Update and me, Joglev66 from Hour of the Truth, reading and discussing the book The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. As I told you before we went into the little break, we are continuing now on page 25, which is called Christ's Second Coming and Unfulfilled Prophecies. We are going even deeper into preterism and actually showing you what kind of lie preterism and futurism together are. A significant error and the scriptural responses to that error are found below. Some preterists believe that although Christ did come at Pentecost in 33 AD and 70 AD, well, whether he comes at 33 AD or 70 AD and not and, <laughs> otherwise he would have come back twice, he will make a final appearance at the end of the world age. Others strongly maintain that his second appearance was a spiritual one in 70 AD, and that is the end of it. Now please note that the following scriptures are very clear and not limited to one or two obscure verses that might easily be interpreted as one wished. The authors are of the highest caliber, who were honest, godly men, filled with the Holy Spirit. We are speaking about Luke, John and Paul. Please read and listen carefully and prayerfully. In Acts chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, we read, quote, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by him in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall also come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Unquote. Now, as you probably remember from the broadcast before, I was looking and I, th I, I thought that was standing already in John 16, but that is in Acts chapter 1. I was saying, because we were reading then, that uh, some people thought that Christ returned spiritually either at Pentecost or at 70 AD at the destruction of Jerusalem. Therefore, we must be in the kingdom now. That's one of the errors we read on page 23. And Acts chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, that I just read to you, absolutely tells that that interpretation is a lie. In Titus chapter 2, verse 13, we read, quote, Looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ." Unquote. In 2 Timothy 2, verses 15 through 18, we read, quote, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat, us, uh, eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some." Unquote. Now Paul wrote these words to Timothy in late 67 AD or early 68 AD. For those who believe that Christ returned at Pentecost, which is approximately in 33 AD, and thus that the resurrection has occurred, Paul has laid their claims to rest. For those who believe he secretly returned at 70 AD, see Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 through 6 at the end of these passages. So I won't see, uh, read this now because that is on the bottom of page 27 which is still to come. Do you have any comment up to here Tom or shall I just continue reading? Let's continue, but just know that even in the early church, there were some who were surmising and speculating and teaching falsely and leading God's people astray. The uh, mystery of iniquity was already at work to tear down the church that Paul and the apostles built. And uh, to say that Christ has already come, Paul lays to rest. He did not come. And he said... Uh, that uh, and further, and I'm sure uh, be before I, uh, you know, proceed farther than the book has taken us so far, I'll just reserve my comments mm -hmm. until then. 
uh, go go ahead then. Okay, but we have to remember ourselves that the Bible also says that uh, false teachers will come into the flock, um, wolves in sheep's clothing, and mm -hmm. they will do wrong teaching. And that already was a warning for the very first churches. So, um, we are going to read now from John chapter 14, verse 3, quote, and if I... First John. First John. First uh, John 3, First John 3, 2, uh, John 3, 2 no, that's, right? That's the second one, Tom. Uh, first comes oh, John 14, verse I, I, 3. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay. That's okay. I don't want to skip this. <laughs> the second one is First John. So My apologies. Can happen. Can happen, Tom. John 14, verse 3, quote, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Unquote. And in 1 John 3, verse 2, we read, quote, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we will know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For he shall see him, for we shall see him as he is. Unquote. Do we see him as he is today? Are we like him? Well, are we where he is? When you are using <laughs> spiritual exercises, that answer can be given yes. But when you adhere to the Bible and you don't perform spiritual exercises, the answer is actually no. We don't see him as he is today, and we surely are not like him, because we are still in the corruptible flesh. That's the point you wanted to make, eh? No, can I add more to this? Yeah, this is from the, the book of Daniel. We haven't even gotten there yet. I don't know if the author even includes this. But Daniel gives us a, a, a vision depicting what will happen when Christ does literally return, when he brings his kingdom down to us from heaven. And I believe it's in Daniel chapter 7 where it describes the kingdoms of the earth in, a, in, a, in an image like a man with a head of gold and shoulders and arms of bronze, uh, of, of silver and thighs and uh, uh, abdomen of, of uh of uh, brass, that's Daniel two, Tom, and then and we two will turn iron to that. legs. That's, uh, that's Daniel 2, and we will turn to that in a few pages. Oh, yeah. oh. oh well, I'll leave it till then. <laughs> but 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 even even Daniel prophesied what would evidence the literal return of Christ, and what he is literally describing mm -hmm. is the destruction of all the kingdoms of the earth. They turn to dust and be gone with the wind. They turn to dust and they're blown away with the wind. Now, all we have to do is look out the window and we can tell that the kingdoms of the earth <laughs> still exist, don't they? Yeah. We're still oppressed by the kingdoms of this earth, aren't we? We're still oppressed by the God of this world and his temporal servant, the kings of the world. We know from Daniel's prophecy that Christ has not yet returned. And if we look at ourselves and stretch out our arms and look at our arms, if we pinch our arms and it hurts, we know Christ has not returned because we're still flesh. Yeah, Tom, we still pay okay. our taxes, eh? We, yes. <laughs> and he says, he says, he says in First John chapter three verse two, he says, "Beloved, now are we the sons of God." And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. In other words, we're the sons of God now, but we have not yet undergone the transformation from mortal to immortal. The scripture tells us we, this mortality must take on immortality. This, right? corruptible this, mortal, incorruptible, this yeah. mortal must take on immortality. This corrupt must take on incorruption. Well, are you still in a body of flesh? Okay. It simply means Christ has not returned. And he says, but we know that when when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What does the scripture tell us? It says no man has seen God at any time. And lived. And lived to tell about it. Mm. 
okay? In order, in order to witness the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, in all of his glory, we have to be glorified like him, or our flesh would be consumed by the brightness of his coming. So that's when the mortal takes on the immortality. That's when the corruption takes on incorruption at Christ's second coming. Because if we were to see him in our fleshly bodies when he comes, we would be consumed. So we must be translated into our glorious body like his glorious body before we see him. Okay? It, it's very clear what it's saying here. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when, we, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We will be of the form and likeness of him. Otherwise, we would be consumed by the brightness of his coming just like the wicked will be consumed with the brightness of his coming. So that is the change that takes place. The corruption takes on incorruption. The mortal takes on immortality. The graves are opened, and the, and the spirit ascends from the grave. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together, we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and we shall be caught up together with them, and so shall we ever be with the Lord." So, so all of the teachings of the Bible go together. Peace upon peace, we come to a proper understanding. And uh, Daniel described this. The Apostle Paul described it. The, 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 the prophet John described it. And we can't make a mistake unless we listen to the churches. Okay, back to you, Yerk. Yeah. So we have established that we are still in the flesh and listening to the reading on the internet that Jörg and Tom prepared for you in the origin of futurism and preterism. So we are not changed yet and we are not living in the kingdom of God yet, even though some preterists maybe think that. We continue reading in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, quote, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come, unquote. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, we read, quote, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so then also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Unquote. It should be an obvious fact that Jesus' second coming and the resurrection of the righteous occur as one event. The resurrection is a result of his coming. In Second Peter chapter three, verses three to four, we read Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Unquote. Knowing this first, there shall come in the last day scoffers. Mm -hmm. You know, there are many people who warn of those scoffers and become one their self. Uh -oh. I do not sit here <laughs> to bash anyone, but if any one of my listeners still listens to the new broadcasts of a person who calls himself Kent Hovind, you will see what I mean. In his Creation versus Evolution seminaries, he was speaking of those scuffers. 
since he was released from prison last year, he does not identify the Antichrist as he is identified biblically, as he is identified historically, as we are telling you here, there is no preterist, there is no futurist, and there is also no Mahdi, no Islamic Antichrist, but the Antichrist sits in Rome. Kent Hoven changed his teaching of the Antichrist to now Islam is the Antichrist. He became one of the scoffers that he warned about in his early work before he went to prison, and probably they broke him. One of the proofs, his son's mystery, ministry is a 501c3. Need I say more? Is there any comment from you, Tom? Or otherwise, I just continue. No, you said it quite well. My heart is uh, broken over Ken Hoven. And uh, it uh, just clearly identifies to me now who controls the prisons. Yeah. Because it was in the prisons that uh, Kent Hovind went from truth to error. Kent Hovind knew who the Antichrist was before he came out of the prisons. Now he says it's someone else. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so now we know who controls the prisons. Yeah, the, the, point, the beast. The point is, Tom, when you followed Kent Hovind a little bit, even during he was in prison, he gave some interviews in that time. And one of the interviews that I saw, he said that they were going to charge him uh, with a sentence of 140 years. And shortly after that, all of a sudden, he was set free. And from the moment he was set free, he changed his policy of declaring who the Antichrist was. I mean, yeah. everyone with open eyes can count one and one as two, right? Yes, it's, can't deny it's that. It's a shame. It's a shame for that person. And I am not bashing Kent Hovind. I pray for him that he will come back to the truth that he sold out for, for whatever reason. But even though, if he is a as he says, 100% Bible-believing Christian, and they threaten him or his family, well, when he knows that he and his family are saved because they all accepted Jesus Christ and walk in the same light of the Bible, then you can't threaten anyone with that. All throughout Rome's history, she threatened with death anyone who kept on with the belief that the papacy was the Antichrist. And many of them went to their deaths in flames, denying the Pope as the Antichrist. I wish I could say the same for Kent Hovind. That's all I'm going to say about it. Yeah, so let's continue to include him in our prayers that he, like many of the other betrayed people, will come to the truth of the Bible, of the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. Where in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, we read the following, quote, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years." Unquote. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Be part of the first fruits. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, we read, quote, and to you who are troubled, rest with us, 
when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Unquote. Has history ever recorded this awesome event? Is there anything? The answer is, the answer is no. <laughs> the answer is no. Christ has not already returned. And Paul set the record straight. And uh, those who would say, as does the papacy, that the global kingdom of Christ as manifest in the world by the Roman Catholic Church and the ecumenical reunion of the Protestant churches back to the Roman Catholic Church and the conquering of all the other religions of the world is the global kingdom of Christ is a lie. Christ did not return in 70 AD or 33 AD. He did not return in spirit with the rise of the papacy. The entire church age has been the kingdom of Antichrist reigning and lording it over the kingdom of Christ for nearly 2,000 years. That's the historical, prophetic, and biblical truth. And we await the coming of our Messiah. We await, we await our glorification and our redemption, our resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous, the first resurrection. Until that day comes, we can surely say the kingdom of Christ is not manifest yet in the world because our king is not re not returned. But he is coming, and we wait for him. Back to you, Yerk. Patiently, we wait for him. In Hebrews 9, verses 27 through 28, we read the following, quote, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Unquote. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21, we read, quote, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Unquote. Our vile body shall be changed when Jesus Christ comes. Our bodies continue to age daily. They are not perfect. They are subject to decay or corruption. They become ill, they have not been fashioned like unto his glorious body, because he has not yet returned. And we have not been resurrected, nor have we changed. The modernist, rationalists, and so these were the Germans of the 19th century that we spoke about in another broadcast, the modernists, rationalists, and as Dr. Elliot describes them, E.B. Elliot from Horae Apocalyptica, quote, those of the infidel school, unquote, are found spiritualizing the following verses from Luke chapter 1. Surely no Christian would do so. Well, it is a difference whether you call yourself a Christian or you are a Christian. However, just as absurd would be an attempt to read verses 30 through 31 literally, yet spiritualize verses 32, 33. Now here comes Luke 1, chapter, uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 33. Remember what I just said. It is absurd to would in an attempt to read verses 30 through 31 literally, yet spiritualize the latter part, verses 32 through 33. Quote. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. 
and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob for ever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Unquote. Again, it is a matter of timing. The Christ was conceived and brought forth. Now we await his return for God to give him the throne of David and for him to reign over his kingdom on earth as promised. The kingdom that he purchased which is with his own blood that he shed on the cross for all of us. To you who have read these scriptures pertaining to the second coming of Christ, the question, how readest thou? Historicists have been forced to the conclusion that those who can read these scriptures and maintain they do not mean what they clearly state, but need changing, twisting or spiritualizing, must have come to the Bible with preconceived conclusions and are desperately looking for scriptures to hang them on. Now, Tom, you have any comments as we have gone so far already? Yes. The Roman Catholic Church is uh, the ones who have deluded the Christian world. And we've forgotten the, histor the historicist interpretation of the scriptures and believed in lies, futurism and preterism. And that requires a rewriting of the Bible and spiritualizing some things that the, meant the Bible w was meant to take literally and taking literally those things which the Bible spiritualizes. Changing, twisting, and spiritualizing. That's what the Roman That's Catholic Satan's Church business. does. That's Satan's business. Yep. And it is manifest in the world through Roman Catholic teaching. There's no other conclusion that can be drawn. Now on the next page, on page 30, we read some very interesting Bible prophecy. Unfulfilled prophecy as of 70 AD. This is section 3 on page 30 of the book, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. According to preterism, all prophecy given must have found fulfillment during the period between its origin and 70 AD. And some preterists extend that to fall of that the fall of pagan Rome in 410 A.D. Now let me tell you just one thing: if everything happened in 70 A.D., then John the Revelator was not given a revelation, was not given a glance into the future, but was given a glance into the past, because very good because point. he wrote on the island of Patmos the Book of Revelation in 95, 96 A.D. Very good point. And that's another point, Tom. When we believe that, we make Jesus Christ a liar. We make the Bible a liar. That's right. We make the Apostle John, the Prophet John, a liar. Yeah. You know, it says when we come to Revelation 1, in the very first sentences, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. No. Now, when these things must shortly come to pass, I ask you, how can they have happened in 70 AD? They wish to destroy the credibility of the Bible. They teach things that make the Bible incredible. They teach lies that not even a kindergartner would believe if he were familiar with the scripture. In other words, Scripture always tells us the truth. That's right. We always come back the to the authorized same point. King James Bible. Yeah, we always come back to the same point. It's yep. it's just wonderful how when you when you know Scripture, how easily you can uncover the lie. You got to be a good Berean. You have to confirm everything with Scripture. And if you have a different method of coming to the truth, you're bound to be deceived. 
Okay. Again, timing is the issue, the author continues. Historicists believe many prophecies have not been fulfilled or were fulfilled after 410 AD. Now read the following carefully and prayerfully using your common sense. Everybody has been given a common sense. Most of us don't use it anymore because we are taught not to use our common sense, but just listen to what the so-called authorities teach us or indoctrinate us with. So it is important that now reading slowly, carefully and prayerfully using your common sense. Yes, Tom? No, I, I was just uh, uh, coughing here. Oh, okay. I cleared my throat, <laughs> okay. so back to you. The prophecy chosen for this little booklet is the well-known story found in Daniel 2 of Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar and his dream of a great image. I will quote now from Daniel chapter 2 verses 31 through 35 and later on 36 through 43, but actually I would love to do the whole chapter 2 of Daniel because it's just a wonderful chapter. But let us restrain to the quotes that are given in this book. Daniel chapter 2, verses 1, 31 through 35. Quote, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breasts and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron, part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Unquote. A mountain in Bible prophecy is a kingdom. Eh? That's right. That's the kingdom of God right. that Jesus will establish when he smites the image. And it never ends and it does not coexist with all the governments of the world that now reign. As represented in Daniel's image, Daniel's image represented that head of gold which he said was Nebuchadnezzar himself, the king of Babylon, and his successor would be the Medo-Persian Empire that conquered it, which would be succeeded by the, by the Greek Empire which conquered it, and then finally, and finally, the fourth and final empire on the earth, the Roman Empire, which conquered the Greek empire that's the fourth and final kingdom upon the earth before Christ comes so the the kingdom that exists on the earth at the time of Christ coming is the Roman Empire now Rome would have us believe that ended in 410 AD but the Spirit of God and of prophecy tells us that we're still under the Roman Empire, only under the form of the Papal Roman Empire. The Roman Empire still rules and reigns. There's no sixth empire to succeed the Roman Empire, except that empire that's brought by Christ. Fifth, you mean. And it's described... It's described as a stone that was cut out of the mountains without hands. That is Christ. And he strikes that image in the feet. In other words, the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, he strikes that image in the feet. That image represents all of the empires, the human governments that have existed from Daniel's day to ours. Yeah, all... And he gr it strikes them in the feet and grinds them to powder and they blow away with the wind. There won't be one vestige of any of those fire, those four 
prior empires that will exist when Christ sets up his kingdom when he returns. So if we look out the window and we still see the Roman Empire in control of our presidents, in control of the kings of the earth, ruling and reigning and lording it over and persecuting God's people, if we're still in a robe of flesh, a corruptible, as the prophet called it, our vile bodies, then we know Christ has not yet returned. Because when Christ returns, all the kingdoms of this earth will have been ground to powder and blown away with the wind. And we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye because we will be like him. Because to, if we're not like him, we will be ground to powder too. So we must be changed. It all makes sense, doesn't it? So what happens to the preterist view of Bible prophecy? which says that all the Bible prophecies were fulfilled at 70 A.D., and we're now living in the kingdom of Christ under the papacy, that the papacy is the vicar of Christ and that we have to conquer the whole world to worship and serve and obey him. We're still in a robe of flesh. We're still in our vile bodies. The Roman Empire is still alive and well and killing War defines our world today. There's no prince of peace here. There's only the prince of war, the destroyer, Abaddon. So is this truly the kingdom of Christ as Rome would have us believe? Are the Protestants who have repudiated their Protestant beliefs and are seeking unity and to be absorbed back into the Roman Catholic Church, is that where Christ is leading us? Or is it the blind leading the blind? Or does Antichrist come in the future? I say he's with us all along. I say there's only one candidate in all world history for the, for the Antichrist, and that's the papacy, the one who replaced the Roman Caesars, the one who still calls himself the Roman Pope in the Roman Catholic Church. It's erroneous to refer to the Roman Catholic Church as just the Catholic Church. It's the Roman Catholic Church. Prophecy fulfilled. Daniel prophesied four kingdoms. Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome. Four empires. Then Christ's. Can I ask you a now question? You know, now you know who reigns over the governments of the world. Otherwise, you don't believe Daniel's prophecy. You're calling Daniel a liar. You're calling the Bible a liar. To deny that Rome still controls the kings of the earth, that the papacy controls the governments of the earth, is to call Daniel a liar. Daniel never described a fifth empire, a sixth empire, except Christ. So we are left with only one option for who governs the world. It's Roman. If we're not in the kingdom of Christ, then we must be in the Roman Empire. And Rome must literally control the governments of the world or the Bible is a liar. That's what Rome would have us believe, that the Bible is a liar. That this holy Roman Empire of the Pope is literally the kingdom of Christ. Is that what we choose to believe? Not me. Certainly not Yerk. You see how untenable preterism is? It's laughable. It denies the clear, elemental language of the Scripture that even a child could understand. Look, I don't count myself to be extraordinarily intelligent. In a lot of ways, I describe myself as having the mind of a child. I'm no sage. I'm no genius. I simply read the plain English of the Scripture and use my common sense Common sense dictates that we understand we're still under Rome's control because Christ's 
kingdom has not yet replaced it. We're still in our sinful, vile, mortal bodies. We are not wearing glorious bodies like his glorious body. All the kingdoms of the earth still exist. So we must be still under Roman control. Now, the, the, the people would deny that, that the, the Vatican has that much trouble or that much power and control in the world. But we're not to know this. It's their job to keep this secret. And yet, it's not even a secret. One of the last books I read on Inquisition Update was entitled The Global Vatican by a former ambassador of the United States to the Holy See in Rome, Francis Rooney, a Vatican insider and a, and a, and a, a cabinet member of, of the of George W. Bush administration. And if you read that book, you can come to no other conclusion that the Pope still controls the governments of the world. It's an open admission by a Knight of Malta, by a Roman Catholic, Jesuit-trained Roman Catholic. He wrote a book. His name's Francis Rooney. He titled his book, The Global Vatican. It's not just an admission. It's a boast that the Vatican controls the governments of the world. It even lays out how he does it. He even controls the United Nations. It's admitted in the book. Now, am I to argue? Are any of us to argue what a high knight of Malta wrote in his book? Surely it would never have been released if it hadn't been for the approval of the Vatican to start with. You can read that book for yourself. It's available for sale right now. It's currently copyrighted. You can read that book for yourself. Just buy it at Barnes & Noble or wherever they're selling it. The Global Vatican by Francis Rooney, former U.S. ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney. Daniel's prophecy was perfect. And we do still see Roman control. Rome is admitting Roman control, Vatican control over the governments of the world. Even the United Nations and the world court. It's not speculation. It's not hearsay. It's not just a blind accusation. A high knight of Malta admitted it in his book. So who are any of us to argue if we argued against this, we'd be arguing in despite our own face, despite our own common sense, despite our own Bible. To say that Christ's kingdom is already here, that's what the Pope and the ecumenical movement would have us believe. No, it's the reign of Antichrist that's here. It's the Roman Empire that's here. And, the, and it, it dares to call itself holy. And it has persecuted the saints for 2,000 years in a much greater scale and with more brutality and less, and less mercy than the ancient pagan Roman Caesars. A much lar longer duration. The prophecies were true. The authorized King James Bur Bible is perfect. It's perfect. And it leaves no room for doubt. How else would we expect God to communicate with us but perfect common sense and verifiable in history? Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I want to go back to a few points that you just mentioned. First of all, you mentioned your reading of the Global Vatican on First Amendment Radio that you did in 2015 and 2016. Uh, you advise people to get the book and to read it. I advise people, when they do that, to go rather to First Amendment Radio and follow your readings there, which are all put into a playlist of 99 videos or watch them on my Vimeo channel, where I also upload them on Vimeo. Because reading that book without the understanding that you put in there and the analysis that you put in there can be very dangerous. 
and it can very easily be misunderstood because we have to understand that most of the people we give this advice to are betrayed anyway. And when they read yeah. a Roman Catholic book like that without the explanation that you give in that wonderful um, dissertation that you did with the Global Vatican, it can be very easily wrongly understood. That is point one that I want to make. I agree. So um, the playlist of uh, Tom Fress reading and discussing this book on Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio can be found in the description box of this video. Just uh, click on the more information in the, the uh, on the description box of this video. Scroll down until you find that playlist. Go there and you will find the playlist on First Amendment Radio. Um, my Vimeo channel, uh, I will probably put the link in also there and you can see whatever uh, thing you choose to listen to, but it's the same broadcast. Um, second, <clears throat> there was another point that I wanted to make because I was just reading Daniel 2 verses 34, uh, 31 through 35, which was actually just the explanation of the dream that the king had because the king Nebuchadnezzar could not remember what the dream was all about and he could not understand uh, the interpretation of it so to the interpretation of that we go in the next little reading that i will do but this was just what he dreamed what this dream was all about and there are two videos that i would like my uh, my viewers to uh, go to when you uh, type that in into the search engine in youtube the one is called daniel the protestant interpretation and the other one is called The Forgotten Dream. When you watch one of these two, or both videos of those, they are both about an hour long, there will be no question about Daniel anymore. Especially the video The Forgotten Dream, I found wonderful. I think, Tom, uh, didn't you see that some time ago? I sent you the link at that time. I'm sure I it's, probably did. It's about, it's about <laughs> this, uh, this German soldier who was uh, called to his superior and he asked him, uh, are, we gonna to win, are we going to win the war? <laughs> and uh, he said, well, when I can, sp can speak unofficially, and he could speak unofficially, he said, no, and I'm going to show you how. And he showed him the Bible. That is in the video, The Forgotten Dream. And it is not a story. It is not a fable that is told there. It is the actual experience of the guy who tells this, because that was the experience of his grandfather in the Second World War. And the other one, Daniel, the Protestant interpretation, also deals with that and also deals with the, uh, which I find very uh, intriguing in that video, the wrong interpretation that the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches about the 2300 days prophecy. That is wonderfully explained in Daniel, the Protestant interpretation. So, just take to note, please, that I advise everyone to listen to Tom reading the Global Vatican on First Amendment Radio which you can find the playlist in the video in uh, in this video here or go to my Vimeo channel where you can follow that there the choice is yours it's the same reading and of course watch these two videos on the prophecies of Daniel Daniel the protestant interpretation or the forgotten dream now I just read Daniel 2 31 through 35 as I told you that was just the explanation of what the dream was because Nebuchadnezzar had a dream but he did not understand what the dream was all about so he needed an interpretation and when he turned to his soothsayers and sorcerers and so-called wise men of his kingdom of Babylon in that time and asked them to tell him what his dream was all about they said oh no problem king just tell us what the dream was all about <laughs> And Nebuchadnezzar said, no, you have to tell me what the dream was all about because I don't, I can't do that anymore. To make a long story short, the soothsayers were persecuted because when they can't tell and prophesy the king what dream he dreamt and what the dream was all about, what good are they for? And they came to Daniel's door and wanted to persecute Daniel. And Daniel said, what's the problem? Just lead me to the king and I will tell him the interpretation thereof. And when the king asked him, so you can see that, he said, no, 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 no. But there is a God that knows all these things and that interprets these dreams. 
And then we go to Daniel chapter 2, verses 36 through 43. He interprets now the vision of the king in this chapter 2. Quote, this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold, and after thee shall arise another kingdom, inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall, be, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron hath breaketh all, the, all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it the, uh, of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay." Unquote. Now Tom made a very important point about this prophecy of Daniel in chapter 2, that there are four heathen, pagan kingdoms foretold in the history in the history that starts with the Babylonian captivity because that's, that's where Daniel is given this prophecy. So we are not speaking about four kingdoms in the time of the whole history of the world. We are only speaking of four kingdoms in the time starting at the kingdom of Babylon which was about 500 before Christ's coming. Christ's first coming. We have the kingdom of Babylon, we have the kingdom of Medo-Persia, we have the kingdom of Greece, and we have the kingdom of Rome. Now there are many people out there who think that there must be a fifth kingdom, and that is called the kingdom of the Jews. Because the Jews rule the world, they say. Well, show me where I just read in Daniel anything about a fifth kingdom, where the Jews rule anything. If the Jews... <coughs> Excuse me. If the Jews rule anything, they can only rule under the Romans. Because the Roman Empire is the last empire that we are speaking about here. What did I just say? When the Jews rule, they can only rule under the authority of Rome? Hmm. Now, when we go to the Jewish Encyclopedia, we can find that the Rothschilds, which are generally accepted worldwide as the richest family in the world, which are identified as Satanists, and I don't know whatever, I don't even want to expound on that here right now, but the point that I want to make is when you go to the Jewish Encyclopedia and you look up Rothschilds, you find an article where the Jewish Encyclopedia itself states that at this moment the Rothschilds are the guardians of the Vatican treasure. Now, just that you understand me correctly, who has the power to say what's to be done with the treasure? The owner or the guardian? You answer that for yourself. There is much more to the Rothschilds and the Jews. I did a broadcast on that that is based on a newsletter from Daryl Eberhardt, who Tom Fress worked with together for years, and he can maybe uh, go a little bit into that if he wants to in a coming comment. But in that newsletter of Daryl Eberhardt, I, expl I expressly show how the Jews don't rule anything but that what is given them by Rome. 
And that is the system that we live in. Everything that is ruling here is given. Rome is given the power by the dragon, by Satan itself. And Rome gives power to some Jews to fulfill their work. Because Rome does everything, everything, that it will not be identified as the Antichrist of Scripture. So it just puts up a few Jews in front of you to distract you, to show you, well, well, you know, the Bible is not wrong. Here are the Jews. What are they doing? And you don't understand that Rome is behind them, even though they wear a Maltese cross on their breast. And with that, they identify themselves as being members of Knights of Malta, Knights of the Golden Circle, Knights of the Garter, whatever papal knighthood the Rothschilds are in, they are subservient to Rome. First of all, the Jesuits, whether they are in the Protestant arm of the Counter-Reformation organization called Freemasonry or in the Romish arm which is a papal knighthood. They are subservient to Rome. And so are all others. Because the Bible, dear listener, is true. And the Bible says us, she tells us, that the church reigns over the kings of the earth. And the kings have committed fornication with her. Spiritual fornication. Now, Tom, do you have... Any comment to that, what I just said? Yes. To add to what you just said, we know the Bible records the, the account of the crucifixion of Jesus. And when they brought forth Jesus, uh, the crowd of Jews said, we have no king but Caesar. And uh, the nation of Israel rejected Jesus as their Messiah and Lord and King and swore that they had no king but Caesar. That's still true today. The Caesar in Rome. He still occupies the same throne, still carries the same scepter. There's no fifth kingdom in the world. It's still a Roman kingdom. And the Jews, as you well pointed out in the Jewish encyclopedia, the richest Jewish family in the, po in, in the world, are simply the guardians of the papal treasure. That's what it says in the Jewish Encyclopedia. You can look it up yourself. Go to the Jewish Online Encyclopedia, the Jewish Encyclopedia Online, and under the heading of Rothschild, you can read all about the Rothschilds and their history, and even where it says they are the guardians of the papal treasure. Rome is in control of Israel. It's her creation. And it's created for her purpose. And the Rothschilds, the most influential and wealthy family of the Jewish nation of Israel, are servants of Rome. That cannot be denied. And Daniel's prophecy confirms it. So, <clears throat> just as Yerk said, if the Jews rule the world, it's Rome that gives them the power to do it. And uh, Daniel doesn't give even the option for the Jews to rule the world. It's all about Rome. Okay, back to you then. Yeah, coming back to um, looking up on the Jewish encyclopedia about the Rothschilds, I just want to point out that the year and a half, Tom and I were looking that up ourselves. Tom read Rulers of Evil also on a broadcast on Inquisition Update some years ago on, uh, on Inquisition Update in First Amendment Radio. And I read Rulers of Evil in the year, I don't know, 2015, I think, uh, into 2016 somewhere, in the beginning. And in that book, Rulers of Evil, Tapa Saucy states that the Rothschilds are mentioned in the Jewish Encyclopedia as the guardians of the Vatican treasure. So now you have two options when you read that book. You can take what Tapa Saucy tells you and believe it, or you can do your own research. And I always say, do your own research, because the only truth that you find for yourself is the truth that you can really believe. So one day, I think it was about a year and a half ago, uh, uh, from now, 
Tom and I had a meeting on the internet like today and I brought that up and we were just searching. Now Tom said that he is not a very smart guy and believe me if Tom is not smart I'm dumb as toasted bread. Because when we were looking for this quote, uh, we were looking through the Jewish encyclopedia, I didn't even know that you have the wonderful function on the computer when you use the Ctrl and F button that you can find and search, that you can search and buy that find, that's the way I have to say it, within a page on the internet, certain words. I didn't know that. So you can imagine without knowing that and without using that kind of search and then how long it took, but I know, Tom, I think it was about an hour, right? Half, between half an hour and an hour, we looked into the Jewish encyclopedia. And finally, because I'm too dumb, Tom pointed it out. He found it before me. And we found it for ourselves. And I have, of course, since then, saved the link. So when you are too lazy to do your own research, just write me in the comment section or send an email to Tom and we will provide you the link and otherwise find it please yourself. But do your own research. Now I will go back to the book reading on the bottom of page 31. The author says, in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel had a dream which corresponds to Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2 only it's from God's viewpoint. Daniel chapter 7, verses 2 through 7. Quote, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns." Unquote. Now Daniel was told the interpretation of this dream in verses 16 through 27. Quote, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and my visions of my heart troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by, and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me, and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom, and possess the kingdom for ever, even for ever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the four beasts, which was of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, 
and another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times, and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion, to consume and to destroy it into the, de into the end. And the kingdom and dominion of the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Unquote. A wonderful vision that Daniel was given that leaves no room for interpretation. Now in this Daniel 7, and especially with the Force Beast, and mentioning even the time, um, times and dividing of time, or in other places in the Bible referred to as 42 months, three and a half years, 1260 days, which means 1260 prophetical days, means 1260 literal years, are all characteristics of the Antichrist. Now, I'm using the word characteristics of Antichrist because I did 11 broadcasts, most of them together with Tom and with a few other people, but I think Tom was in at least eight of the broadcasts, where we analyzed 26 different characteristics of Antichrist. Now, if you think this booklet, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism, is not worth that much, if you think that this teaching is not worth that much, just go to my playlist, Characteristics of Antichrist. Watch 25 hours of analyzing and discussing 26 characteristics of Antichrist and see if you can refute them biblically. Not if you can refute them by studies out of the mainstream, out of Roman Catholic or other perverted sources, but scripturally. Scripturally, you cannot attack what we read and discuss in this book, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. Scripturally, you cannot refute what we did in the, set, in the, in the, in the <coughs> sessions of Characteristics of Antichrist. I urge you to do that study and to come to the knowledge the knowledge that will set you free. But please, Tom, I'm looking forward for your comment now. Well, in the earlier rendition of this, uh, in Daniel chapter 2, these beasts that we see in Revelation 7, or rather Daniel chapter 7, are described as metals, gold, silver, brass, and iron. And uh, but their beastly qualities from God's point of view is left yet to be revealed in chapter seven. And God describes what he described originally in, in, by Daniel's vision, or rather Nebuchadnezzar's vision, as the head of gold, the silver uh, arms and chest and the brass uh, thighs and belly and the iron legs and feet and toes. God is describing as beasts, each one of them representing a beast, a separate beast. And the fourth and final beast is unlike the other three before it, dreadful and terrible. And it's headed up by a man who speaks blasphemies against the Most High and persecutes the saints of the Most High. That's describing the fourth and final empire on the earth. It's described as a beast. Now, everybody asks me, well, Tom, what is the mark of the beast? It's the beast's identification or claim over your soul. What is the mark of the beast? It's the beast's mark upon you. Do you belong to this Roman Empire? Are you a citizen of this Roman Empire? 
this fourth and final beast on the earth that thinks he can change God's times and laws? Or do you belong to a different kingdom, a kingdom not of this world, upon whose mark, the, upon whose forehead the beast cannot place his mark? He cannot claim you. Without the mark of God on your head, you have but one other option, the mark of the beast. Who are you going to serve? Christ or his counterfeit in Rome? Are you going to be a citizen of the kingdom of Christ? Have you sworn allegiance only to him? Or have you sworn allegiance to the beast or one of the governments under which... Uh, they serve the Pope. It's as simple as that. Do you have the mark of the beast upon you? Do you consider yourself a citizen of this global empire? Are you ecumenically reunited with this global Roman empire? Do you serve Christ in a and an in an earthly kingdom or are you waiting for a heavenly one to come down from God out of heaven Daniel chapter 7 ref makes us sure that we know who the beast is it is the governments of the world from Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon through Medo-Persian the Grecian and the Roman they are all culminated in the Roman Empire, ultimately all controlled and dominated by the Roman Empire, all conquered by the Roman Empire, which still exists today on a global scale. Are we going to be citizens of that Roman global empire and have the mark of the beast upon us? Or are we going to refuse to become citizens of that Roman Empire and claim Christ as our king. There, this, is a, this is the perfect demonstration of the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy. This describes at least the entire Christian era from the rise of the papacy, that fourth and final beast upon the earth, until the present time. So what of the preterists that say all Bible prophecy is fulfilled before 70 A.D. or before 410 A.D.? What of the futurist interpretation that says Bible prophecies won't be fulfilled until just seven years before Christ returns? How can you have a, an interpret? If you believe either one of those, how can you believe Daniel chapter 7 is talking about the entire Gentile ages from the Babylonian Empire all the way until the return of Christ. You see, the historicists believe that Daniel in chapter 7 records the entire history of the world until Christ returns. And we know when the fourth and final beast on the earth raised its head, that was what Jesus described as the last time, because Rome was in control even before Jesus was born. Jesus plainly told him, this is the last time. Isn't that what he said? This is the last time. He was referring to Daniel's prophecy. Babylon had since fallen to the Medo-Persians, which had since fallen to the Grecian Empire, which had finally fallen to the Roman Empire even before Christ was born. There was no fifth earthly empire to succeed the Roman Empire, and that's why Jesus said, these are the last times. This is the last time, he said. This is the fourth and final empire on the earth, and it will rule and reign until I come back. So we know that he's describing the pagan Roman Empire, which was succeeded by the the Holy Roman Empire, and there was really no change of guard at the, at the, the exchange. 
the Caesars just adopted Christianity as the, as the state religion, and the Pope, the Caesar, became the Pope. The man of sin, the son of perdition. And the Pope inherited the title from the Caesar of Pontifex Maximus, which he still wears that's, today. That's right. Same title that the Caesars carried with them. Pontifex Maximus. Julius Caesar at first, 48 AD. He was given the title. And by that, the emperor was the first time in the Roman Empire that the emperor was made a deity. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the people of the Roman Catholic Church make of the Pope. God. And this problem. Do you remember what, jo what George W. Bush said in an interview a few years ago? When asked, Mr. Bush, where you said famously when you looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes that you saw his soul. What did you see when you looked into Benedict XVI's eyes? God! His immediately res immediate response was, God. Isn't right. that the deification of a man? Mm -hmm. What else is Pontifex Maximus, the supreme bridge builder, but the deification of a man? The combination of church and state. The temporal Caesar becomes your high priest. Pope Pius IX, Pio Nono, who Tom knows much better than I do, in his Discorsi of 1853 wrote, Hail unto the Caesar, the Caesar who now addresses you, and to whom alone obedience and fidelity is due. Those are words of blasphemy. Man owes no allegiance or fidelity to anyone but Christ. Whether he come under the name of Caesar or whether he comes under the name of Pope. And George W. Bush, before the cameras of the world, blasphemed God when he equated the Pope with God. How do you equate the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist, the papacy, with God, without blaspheming. That's, that's what America is. It's a blaspheming nation. It claims the name of Christ, claims Christ's salvation, but serves the man of sin. Obedience, Roman Catholic canon law. That's what the civil laws are designed in this world to emulate. Roman Catholic canon law. You don't see anybody rioting in the streets, protesting. I don't want to be under Roman Catholic canon law. I'm under God's law. There's no mercy or grace under Roman Catholic canon law. I want mercy and grace. Under God's law, not justice, the protest? Not justice of the Antichrist law, which is not to be found. Where, where's anyway. the protest? Where's the protest? It is said over and over the protest is over. By the evidence that I see in the world, it is. And yet they still claim Christ as their Savior. This, this prophecy of Daniel gives 1,260 literal years where the papacy would rule roughshod, like iron, over the saints and would wear out the saints of the Most High and would persecute and kill the saints of the Most High for 1,260 years. That would be 1,260 years of the church age, wouldn't it? Where's your futurism now? Where's your preterism now? Ridiculous, isn't it? We know from history that these 1260 years were literal 1260 years. Daniel foresaw 1260 years of the church's age underneath the rule of the iron 
master in Rome. But for 1260 years, he ran roughshod over God's heritage, killing to the tune of hundreds of millions of them, forbidding them to read their Bible, forbidding them to bow to anyone but, his, but himself. But from that 1260-year period on on, that kingdom of the Pope has been under attack and is wasting away because the truth cannot be refuted. The truth of the Scripture, the truth held by the saints, the universal priesthood of believers, the papacy cannot compare. And we will continue to consume that papal system until Christ comes. What few of us there are remaining will be victorious in the end over Rome's tyranny, over the rule of Antichrist, over the rule of the fourth and final beast upon the world. We will win out over the beastly government of the United States. The truth will prevail. The papacy and all the kingdoms that rule and reign under his authority will be ground to powder and will blow away with the wind. It may look like an impossible thing to us now in our extreme minority and powerlessness, but maybe it's only because we haven't come to maturity yet and realized our potential. It's not our potential. It's Christ's. God said in his word, the world is mine, the earth is mine, and the fullness thereof. The pope would argue with that, and so would the kings of the earth. But I'm going with Christ. He said, the world, the earth is mine, and the fullness thereof. And Christ is going to have his way. And Christ is going to have his kingdom. And we will rule and reign with him for a thousand years after all the kingdoms of this earth are destroyed, after all the beastly governments of this world are destroyed when Christ returns. Until then, we wield the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the truth cannot be refuted, even by masterfully designed fables like futurism and preterism. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, it only rests me to bring this broadcast to an end today. That was quite breathtaking, in my opinion. The first part and the second part, and I want to thank you very much for your contribution in this, Tom. Next time we will continue. I will reread Daniel 7 verses 15 through 27 and then go on on the book on the bottom of page 33, which is in the middle of the book. So we have come that far in these six broadcasts. But uh, for the moment, I want to thank Tom for being part of this wonderful dissertation of the book The Origin of Futurism and Preterism, written by Paul Owen and Charles Jennings which was sent to me by our brother in Christ, um, Brett Norman, who couldn't join us today again because, as we stated, we all have to pay our taxes and he has to go work in the Antichrist system and could not be join us here, but maybe that's for the future. We'll see. Our thoughts are with him. Our prayers are with him, as our prayers are with all our friends and beloved ones, but as sure as our prayers are with the beloved ones, our prayers are also with our enemies. Because Jesus Christ told us that we should pray for our enemies, and we should also pray for the Christians who have fallen from the faith that once set them free, like Kent Hovind that we spoke about earlier in this broadcast. So I want to leave a few closing words to Tom, and then to me to close this up. Blessings in the name of the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ, our Messiah and Lamb of God, the true and only 
King of kings and Lord of lords. Blessings in the name of Jesus. I'll be back next time. Okay. Thank you, Tom, for your contribution here. Thank you, my listeners and viewers of this video, for watching, for commenting. Please, if you have any remarks, don't hesitate to send Tom an email. As different times in this email in this uh, video I blended in you can touch you can touch you can reach him under the email address tom at seawaves.us that is like the waves of the sea s e a w a v e s tom at seawaves.us he expects and looks forward to your righteous comments and questions and every email that asks for answering will be answered like every comment that is righteous and honest formulated will and that asks for an response will i respond to as tom will respond in the emails so once again thank you tom for your contribution thank you my dear listeners and viewers of the video for watching and listening to this video and as always do your own research. Until next time, Jocular66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. God bless you and bye bye.